Thank you everybody for joining us today uh, for another one of our webinars. Um, and uh, today we've invited Dr. Anna, Anna Alsterholm, uh, who is a senior research scientist at the Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech. Um, you know, just real briefly, these are one of our, this is one of my collaborations with the group there that was purely based out of, uh, you know, communicating over Zoom or, or it was blue jeans is what Georgia Tech yeah. uses. Yeah, blue jeans. Um, you know, we have never actually met formally in person, but, you know, through our communications, realized that uh, uh, Dr. Alsterholm was um, really impressive, I would say, talking about uh, electroactive polymers. And so uh, with that, I'll let her um, take it away. Thanks, Jerome, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks again to yeah, Jerome and his colleagues for inviting me to host this um, or uh, have to give this webinar uh, in June. I've been, this is, I'm going to be talking about my absolutely favorite uh, topic, which is um, probing and optimizing redox and swelling properties and electroactive polymers. And this is something I've been doing since, um, since undergrad, so for quite a long time now. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to un unstop my video here to make sure the bandwidth is working and then I'll get right into this. Um, there we go. So I'm gonna be during this webinar touching on quite a few uh, application areas that all can take advantage of these electroactive polymers ability to be both um, electron and ion conductors. And you see some of these examples here. Um, now, Obviously, because all of these um, applications are electrochemical in nature, there's certainly a lot of similarities in terms of how they operate and, and you know, the materials properties that we're looking for. But there's also quite a few differences, especially as it related to the various figures of merit that a material uh, should have to be, you know, work well in these, these areas. Uh, so for example, then, if we think about optical switches, I'm going to be talking a little bit about electrochromic devices today. Um, in addition to color, this is an area where we're looking for materials that ideally can switch between two colored states very, very rapidly. And we're also interested in finding materials that have um, a low charge to switch or a low redox capacity so that we can really get a large change in color with a very small amount of power. Um, if we then think about energy storage, then we're looking at the opposite essentially, because here we wanna be able to have a very high redox capacity. So we want materials then that um, have a high charge to switch, if you will. And as I'm gonna be highlighting in a bit here, um, for, for polymers specifically, or the type of polymers I'm gonna be talking about, we're very interested also in optimizing the oxidation potential. And specifically, we wanna make sure uh, that we have a low oxidation potential. Uh, bioelectronics is a very hot area uh, right now, it's sort of reemerged again. Uh, here again, in addition to these, um, the capacitance, we're interested in, you know, the ion transport and, and really optimizing that because especially when we're thinking about any application like sensing or ion release or any kind of molecular delivery, this is going to become very important. Uh, and at the same time, when we want to interface with anything biological, we of course have to take into consideration that these have the, the, the materials have to be electroactive at neutral pH, they might be in very specific temperature ranges, um, and things like that. And finally, um, when we're thinking about switchable conductivity or tunable conductivity and actuation, here again, we're mainly looking at there, if we're talking about conductivity, we of course want high mobility, we want high carrier densities. Uh, and in actuation, in addition to the carrier density, we also want a large volume change. So again, there are similarities, but also a lot of differences that we, that we uh, take into account as we design new materials and, and develop new, um, new devices. So, I've then chosen to structure this webinar in a way I'm going to give a very, very brief um, introduction to conjugated electroactive polymer to make sure we're on the same page. And then um, mention a few things that we can do in terms of tuning the structure of these materials in order to modify and manipulate um, ion and or electron uh, transport. And then 
I'm going to relate those changes on how they then affect various applications and devices, and then also talk a little bit about um, various in situ probes that we use then to get a better understanding of how materials are working and how that translates into how they then behave in a device. Um, so this is essentially the, the background slide then on um, polymers. I'm going to see if I can get my pointer here. Um, so electroactive um, conjugated polymers are large macromolecules. Uh, and by large, I mean molecular weights on the order of maybe 10,000 to 100,000 grams per mole. So, you know, definitely nothing to frown at, but they're much, much smaller um, and much shorter chains than, than when we think about commodity polymers like polyethylene or polystyrene that goes up to millions of grams per mole. Um, What's, what's really nice about these structures, though, is that they have this conjugated backbone that you see here, these alternating single and double bonds. And it's these bonds, um, or this bond structure that allows us to electrochemically, ox or, or chemically for that matter, oxidize and reduce these polymers very, fairly easily, I would say, at fairly low voltages. So typically, you know, less than a volt. Um, and so what happens is if we take, um, one of these polymers then, and we, we code it on top of an electrode, uh, we're gonna be able to electrochemically then, in, the, in, in this example here, oxidize it. And so what's gonna happen then is we're gonna extract electrons from this conjugated system, and we're gonna begin forming these radical cations and eventually these dications. And because we have this uh, conjugated backbone, um, essentially these, these cations and dications or charge carriers as I call them, or as, as they're called, uh, can actually migrate along this conjugated backbone, which then, of course, is, in other words, we have electron conductivity. We have charge moving along the chain. And at the same time, you know, this is a redox process. There's charge neutrality conditions that have to be met. And so there's also going to be then uh, anions that have to uh, be present close to these um, dicatas and, and, and radical cations in order to balance, balance it out. So this is what then gives uh, us these ion transport properties that we can take advantage of. And for some reason, okay, I'm, it's giving me a hard time here. Okay, so the reason um, our group is interested in polymers, there are certainly other materials that can also be used in, in all of the, the devices that I'm going to be talking about. But the reason we really like polymers is that we have a lot of synthetic flexibility and versatility. Uh, there's a lot of knobs we can turn, in other words, and, and a lot of ways we can fairly easily manipulate the structure in order to tune a certain property. Uh, so we've gotten pretty good at now at finding ways to really optimize oxidation potential uh, there's several strategies um, that we can use in order to really enhance the redox stability. And this is for very important for any application. And another thing that we've been working a lot on over these past few years is really looking at these blue R groups here, uh, which is what allows us to tune processability. And so in the, all the examples I'm going to show, we're going to, these blue R groups that look, uh, you know, fairly small here are actually not small groups at all. They're actually these long hydrocarbon chains typically, or, or there's also examples of using these um, more polar oligoether type chains. And what these large substituents do is that they provide solubility. And so we can make these fairly large polymers then um, into inks. And that allows us, of course, then to print them or here I'm showing an example of a slot die coating. Uh, to make these into thin films then on, on a range of different electrode uh, substrates. Um, now, these are fairly thin, you know, in the big scheme of things. We're talking something on the order of 100 nanometers to several, a few microns, depending on what it is you're, you're trying to, what type of device you're making. Uh, but from an electrochemistry perspective, these are very thick. So the, the redox behavior or the cyclic voltammetry is going to look nothing like this beautiful symmetrical curve here on the left where we have this nice perfect monolayer of redox active, some redox active molecule. And so in reality, we're looking at something that looks like this on the right. Um, it's fairly undefined. Uh, there's a couple of here, we have a couple of different peaks on the, on the reverse scan. 
we have a bit of a some kind of capacitive looking plateau and uh, towards here at higher voltages and really just looking at a cyclic voltammogram um i would say is, is it's going to be quite difficult to assign these different peaks to a certain redox process or a certain part of your your sample which is really why the the field um is very interested in using various in situ probes which i'm going to be talking about um and honestly, you know, if you really think about what's going on, it's really not a surprise um, that the redox processes are, or the redox response rather, is complicated because we're not just talking about a simple electron transfer between a sample and an electro. We're talking about large, large changes occurring in these samples. So, you know, as we're oxidizing uh, these polymers, we're forming these cations and, and, and dications, and we're changing the conductivity as a result, as a function of oxidation state. And this, this change is actually fairly large. We're talking multiple, multiple orders of magnitude. Um, where of course, then we, we're talking about these counter ions that are gonna have to penetrate through the sample uh, for charge balance. They're gonna bring some solvent along with them. So there's a lot of volume changes happening. Um, in some cases, this can go up to several hundred percent. Um, certainly microstructure and morphology, you know, as we have these solvated ions again, you know, where, you know, the polymer chains are going to be pushed further apart potentially, and, and that's going to have an impact then on the, on the redox process. And to make it even more fun, you know, the rate of these processes is, is going to depend on what interface you're looking at. So there really is a lot of stuff um, going on here. Um, before I then go into the more applied side, I do want to mention something that is very, very important. And I think something that the field um, is very interested in understanding better, and that is intermolecular interactions. And so what you can imagine is when you, you have any kind of device, be that a small transistor, or it could be a large electrochromic window or something else, these, regardless of what it is, these device dimensions are much, much larger than the length of your polymer. And so if we want electron transport or charge transport to occur through the whole sample, uh, it's not sufficient that we get, um, that these charge carriers can migrate along chains. They also need to be able to travel between chains. Um, and in a perfect world, when we would make these thin films, we would have all our, our chains perfectly aligned side by side. They'd have this ideal spacing that's just right for, uh, for these charge shares carriers to, to hop from one chain to another. But in reality, of course, we're pretty far from that. We actually look more like what I'm showing schematically here on the bottom. We're essentially looking like a bowl of spaghetti. So there's going to be certainly domains here that we might have a bit of order. We might have polymer chains that are nicely aligned and they're going to have an easy time. Electrons are going to have an easy time to, to jump. Um, there's going to be other areas that are fairly amorphous and disorder. We might even be forming these dead ends for these um, radical cations and, and, and really hamper what it is that we can extract out the other end of the device. So this is something that's important to keep in mind. And I think something that the field right now is working pretty hard at trying to figure out how we can actually control and better understand how these materials assemble in order to, in that way, enhance uh, and optimize um, the device performance. So without further ado, then I'm going to jump right into the first uh, application, and that's going to be talking about energy storage. And I'm going to be talking specifically about supercapacitors, because that's what our group has done quite a bit of work in. Um, and so the reason these, these polymers, you know, in the early days, we're talking late seventies, early eighties, um, you know, were proposed to be interesting candidates for batteries and, and other energy storage devices was for the, the, this very reason that we can form these positive or we can oxidize or reduce polymer chains. And so essentially we can create and store charge through the bulk of a film, not just at the surface. So we don't have to rely just on double layer capacitance like we do in a, in a conventional supercapacitor that uses some kind of three-dimensional carbon electrode. We can actually take advantage of the whole thing. And that then has the advantage, of course, that we can decrease potentially the footprint 
of of the energy storage device, which you know where we're at right now is of course something where this area of flexible electronics is pretty interested in in using. Okay, so just um, this is just a very again a brief sort of introduction to symmetric supercapacitors and what they look like. Um, they're very simple devices. Um, in, in the case of these symmetric devices, we have the same um, material on both the positive and negative electrode anode or cathode. Um, and the schematic here on the right then is showing um, the redox process that, the, that, or the redox state that this oxidation state that these polymers are in um, when the device is either charged or discharged. Um, from the point of view of a figure of merit here, energy density is probably the most important one. And the energy density of, of this device will depend on the capacitance, not surprisingly, uh, but then the voltage squared. And it's because of this voltage squared dependence that we are very interested in um, optimizing the oxidation potential and the voltage. Um, and so what I'm showing here is, you know, what are some of the other, in addition then to optimizing voltage, what are the other things that we have to be thinking about? Um, and what I'm showing here on the left-hand side is the ideal, you know, when you, when you go to, you assembled your supercapacitor and when you go to look at your device performance, what is it that you want to see? Well, you want to see your charge discharge curve or your potential versus time plot to be perfectly symmetrical. And you want your cyclic voltammergram to be this really nice rectangle. Essentially, what that means is you want your current to be independent of the voltage. And this makes good sense. You know, if you are you have some device that you're trying to charge, you want the current that's coming out of your supercapacitor to be constant. Um, but in reality, if you look at the literature, especially the, the polymer literature, you see something that looks more like this on the right hand side here. So we're talking about something that's pretty far from the ideal situation. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons that, you know, you see this, this asymmetry, uh, but, but some of that definitely has to do with um, internal resistances inside of your device. And so this is another thing that we really want to optimize um, is to make sure that we have um, as little resistance as possible, because that will bring us closer to this ideal uh, behavior. So for polymers, then, what does that mean? Well, it means that we, of course, want a high capacitance, uh, but we really want, because of the voltage squared, we want these materials to be electroactive over a very broad voltage window so that we can really maximize this uh, part of the equation. And of course, we want to then, you know, looking at the CV, we want to be able to maintain a pretty high redox current, ideally without a lot of peaks. Um, and then fast, of course. And Again, this is where we, it's really nice to work with polymers. Over the years, we've found uh, several strategies to really, uh, by making copolymers, of, of really optimizing uh, capacitance and oxidation potential, and to really uh, work on this energy density part. Uh, this other figure of merit that's important in supercapacitors, or any charge storage device for that matter, is um, power density which is related to the rate that you can charge your um, device. And in this case, when we're talking about polymers and these polymers that are conducting, um, the discharge rate is typically not a big concern. These are typically relatively fast on the order of a second or less. So this is really not something we worry too much about. Uh, we really have uh, been working mainly on optimizing energy density. And this is gonna be one of my few chemistry slides I'm going to show here. So our approach then when we were, we actually, it was our program manager who asked us if we we're able to make a soluble polymer that has a, that's a good supercapacitor material. And so our approach to this was then to find ways where we could have a structure where we would reduce steric interactions. We wanted to make the backbone as planar as possible. And we wanted to make sure that it was an electron rich polymer. And the reason, uh, without going into too much detail of why we wanted to do this, uh, was is that all of these combined will contribute to lowering the onset of oxidation, um, which is good because we want the voltage window to be broad. In addition, when you uh, work towards enhancing planarization and making the backbone more planar, we hypothesize then 
that that should really be able to enhance uh, charge transport along the chain, uh, which, you know, does many things, but in part could really contribute into helping us with these internal resistance issues that many uh, polymer materials have. And so we started off with, with um, a very well-performing um, electroactive polymer. Uh, and here again, I'm highlighting these uh, functional groups. These are large hydrocarbon chains, ethyl hexyl, or even like, you know, 10 car uh, 16 carbons. Um, on one chain. And so what we wanted to do then was we sort of started here because this works very well, it's very soluble, it's very easy to make thin films. And we started to incorporate these um, ethylene dioxythiophene units here. Now, what's the what I want to sort of highlight here is first of all that you know structurally they're very similar to this propylene dioxythiophene unit. So we're not really um, we're maintaining, you know, an electron rich backbone here. Uh, but what's more important is that these EDA units do not have any functional groups attached to this, this ring. Um, and so we're really able to space out the solubilizing groups by adding these, you know, you can think of them as spacer units. And so this is how we then went about reducing these so called steric interactions between the side, between these uh, side chains um, that we hope then would planarize the, the backbone. And sure enough, this ended up working beautifully well. We saw the more of these spacer units we added, the, the, the more we were able to decrease the oxidation potential, which was fantastic. We saw a decrease of almost 800 millivolts just by adding a few of these spacer units. Um, and we really came to the conclusion then that this, um, we started getting particularly interested in this unit that we called, uh, or this polymer that we called PE2. Uh, because we saw that this had a very low onset of oxidation. But what was even more interesting to us was the fact that you can see this, it's, it's able to maintain, you know, a decent redox current and a sort of e stable redox current here over, you know, a fairly large voltage window. We're talking almost a volt and a half. So this was something that we thought that this structure would be an excellent candidate then um, for supercapacitors, where we were, we'd had the redox response was promising and we still had enough of these units with these hydrocarbon chains on it that we were still able to maintain solubility. Uh, going beyond this, um, you, you wouldn't be able to do that. And so we then took this uh, polymer and started looking into the, some devices. And sure enough, we saw beautiful performance. We saw very symmetrical redox uh, or discharge curves. The CVs looked really nice. This is going up to four volts per second. So this is actually a very, you know, sub-second um, um, cycling here. Um, uh, we also did a lot of impedance spectroscopy. Of course, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that today, but it's a very powerful tool for, for understanding and optimizing supercapacitors and especially really quantifying these various resistances that you may have in your cell. And so we specifically use this for finding a way to optimize polymer loading, which means how thick can we make these films uh, without increasing the resistance too much. And so we were able to um, get quite a lot of information uh, out of this. And then uh, finally, after the fact, we actually realized that this is a very highly conducting polymer as well, going up to 500 siemens per centimeter in certain cases. So maybe it wasn't that surprising then that this ended up working as well as it did. Um, there are certainly other strategies. Not everyone has a, a, you know, a synthetic lab at their disposal. And so there are certainly a lot of other ways too that we can optimize energy density. Uh, for example, we've noticed that the way we print or coat these thin films can have actually a fairly large impact on the redox capacity. And, and this is, goes then back to what I was talking about in terms of these intermolecular interactions in the bowl of spaghetti, where the way we process and the solvents that we use can really be used to tune how these polymer chains assemble. And then in certain, certain coding methods will then end up giving us, you know, some kind of morphology that is um, conducive to, to high transport. And so, uh, there's been some work in this area, uh, and then, you know, we have ways of optimizing both electron and ion transport. Uh, finally, another thing we've done um, is made these, maybe I'd call them hybrid electrodes, 
where we, for example, embedded these polymers into carbon nanotube textiles. Um, we work with NRL to make these conformal coatings on carbon fibers. And this is essentially a fairly easy way actually to boost capacitance where we, but instead, but instead of changing the polymer, we're just uh, playing with the double layer capacitance here. Okay, so moving on then, um, the next thing I'm going to be talking about is optical switches and specifically electrochromic devices. This is um, uh, something our group has worked uh, a lot in over the years um, and something I really enjoy um, talking about. Um, so just again, a brief recap, electrochromism is a process or a phenomenon where we can change the color of a molecule um, in response to an electrochemical um, process. So it's essentially nothing more than a um, user controlled filter uh, of sorts, where we're essentially using a redox process to change the conformation of a molecule so that we change how it interacts with uh, light. And so what I'm showing here on the left is then photographs. This is one of our simple uh, proof of concept, small electrochromic windows that we use as a you know, a device platform to look at new materials. And here you see it's in its colored absorbing state. And then when we drive a current through it or apply a small voltage, it's less, I would say half a volt or so, uh, we can then make it go uh, clear. Uh, this is uh, certainly nothing new. I'm sure most of you on, on online here have been exposed to electrochromism. You may have been on the Boeing Dreamliner. Uh, their windows are a tad slow, but they, the, the, you know, you can dim them by just pushing a button. Um, most, most of us have um, dimmable rear view mirrors. Um, that's also an electrochromic technology. And then finally, there's actually, there's a lot of buildings popping up now with these electrochromic windows. Uh, we even have one on uh, campus at Georgia Tech, actually. Uh, but where I think polymers or these conjugated polymers can make a, an impact is really in uh, dynamic labels and displays because these can be printed and they can be printed on a range of different uh, substrates. And as I'm gonna show, um, because, because there are large molecules and we can, we can tune the structure, it's easy for us to manipulate the color. Uh, and they're also fairly uh, fast switching as I was highlighting there with the supercapacitors. And so, if you see the video in the middle, top row in the middle there, you can see that these two electrochromic pixels really are switching uh, quite rapidly. Um, so this is something that we believe could be a good way of, of simple ways where your the products that you buy could uh, communicate some kind of information to you. Um, here's just a quick assortment of one of our, you know, small selection of some of the, the materials that we've made uh, and, and the different colors that we can uh, achieve. And essentially what you see here, these are again, a lot of these dioxythiophene uh, units. And again, we're making fairly small changes to the structure and making various copolymers in order to change the conformation of the polymer and to change what wavelengths it's absorbing. So in, its, in their charge neutral state, when they're just you know, processed as a thin film on an electrode, um, you can see a photograph of the different colors. And then when we electrochemically oxidize them, using a small voltage, uh, then they can go into this trans highly transmissive state that you see on, on the next to it. Um, and as a result, of course, we're looking at colors, which means we do a lot of spectroelectrochemistry in our lab. Um, this is very easy to do if you have a spectro uh, spectrophotometer, um, because a cuvette is an ideal little size to make a nice three electrode cell. Um, so here I'm showing a photograph. We have a platinum flag here on the left. We have a silver chloride wire on the right. And then um, we use a lot of ITO as a transparent conductor that allows us then to, you know, have a conducting substrate, but also uh, shine light through it. Uh, and ITO is by far, in my opinion, the best uh, electrode for this, uh, actually mainly because it's electrochemically fairly inert. Um, and so this is, we use this almost exclusively. And what you'll see then in the case, I'm showing this pink polymer or magenta. And what you'll see here is that when it's colored, you know, it's obviously absorbing here in the visible range around 550. And then when it's clear and we don't see it, it's not absorbing anything. So this is what a lot of our, our data looks like. And what's actually happening here is, um, you know, when it's in, because these are highly conjugated molecules, uh, they absorb 
in the visible range. And we can do a lot of structure. We can, again, to the structure to change the, the conjugation and change what wavelengths of light we absorb. And so, but typically we're gonna be somewhere here in the visible. Uh, but then when we electrochemically oxidize them and we form these uh, radical cations, what you can see here is that we're changing the bond structure here. So we're moving these double bonds essentially. And what happens is that this structural reorganization actually causes the chain to planarize because we're forming these sort of double bond like um, bonds here between the, the heterocycles. And what that does is it moves these absorbances to lower energy, which means we move them into the near infrared. And so these are, regardless of, of you know, the state it's in, these, these polymers are highly absorbing. We're just changing where it's absorbing based on the oxidation state of the material. And so this is certainly something that we use for electrochromism, but I would say that this is an extremely powerful tool for anyone who works with polymers or, or electroactive materials, because what you can do is you can really monitor your redox process and, and, and the rate at which uh, you change the oxidation state of your material and how that affects the, the conformation of your molecule and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of fundamental properties that we can also extract from looking at um, the potential dependent spectra. Um, another way to think about this, um, if you don't want to think about a polymer conformation, is that essentially what we're doing is we're starting off when it's absorbing light, green light in this case, we have a, a spring that is coiled. And then when we oxidize and we change the conformation, we're essentially uncoiling the spring and that's uh, and planarizing the chain or, or uncoiling the spring, which allows all uh, wavelengths of light to be uh, transmitted. And it's essentially the same. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, how we design colors, but it's a, we're essentially using uh, similar um, thought processes when we're we're trying to make new colors. Um, and that's essentially where we're basically manipulating how coiled our spring is. So if we want to absorb very high energy light or it's in, in the blue here, we would make a, a polymer that's very coiled or twisted. So we're going to make copolymers that, you know, where we really um, maximize steric strain between, between repeat units. Um, and then conversely, if we want to go the other way and we want to absorb low energy light, we're going to try to make the chain as planar as possible, but still absorbing in the visible. Okay, um, other benefit, um, you know, again, we have the, the, the ability to make these soluble because of these functional groups. So once you make them soluble, we, um, especially if they're soluble in the same solvent, ideally, if you don't have a color you want, we just, you know, mix them together and get the color we want. So this is an example of a Coke red, you know, you can add some cyan and you can make a black if you wanted, or we've made some brown colors just by color mixing. So there's a lot of fun you can do here and a lot of a lot of applications that you could target just by, by blending these together. Um, okay, so then this um, thinking more about what it is we're looking for and how we evaluate a new chromophore. And when you think about electrochromic materials, uh, the main figure of merit I would say that you see in any paper is the contrast. And the contrast is uh, simply the difference in transmittance, typically it could be absorbance too, uh, between this, you know, absorbing state and this transmissive state or between two colored states. So basically, this is just a measure of how well our material turns um, on and off, if you will. Um, so here, in this case, when it's colored, it's absorbing um, a lot of light here at 550. So it's only transmitting about 10%. Uh, and then when we apply 0.8 volts versus ferrocene, uh, it goes into this highly transmissive state and transmits almost 80% of light. And what we would then report in a paper would be that our contrast is 68% in this particular uh, case. Another um, number that people are, tend to be interested in is the coloration efficiency, which is more of than of a electrochemical property. And that is the amount of charge that's required to produce this color change. And as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, of course, we want to be able to make get a very large color change with very little charge in order to be able to really, you know, um, consume as little power as possible when we're switching this window. So this is, uh, and again, very simple um, equation to estimate this and also something that you will see a lot in the literature. The third thing um, 
is how rapidly these materials switch. And this is again, another very simple experiment to do with, with uh, you don't need any kind of fancy spectrophotometer to do this, uh, but essentially all you do is, you know, you, we, again, we coat the film on a transparent conducting substrate. And then we tell our spectrophotometer to measure the transmittance or absorbance at a very specific wavelength. So in our case, of course, uh, usually what you'll see is of course that people want to measure um, what's going on here at this wavelength where, where we see the largest uh, modulation. And here what we essentially do then is we're measuring at you know 550 nanometers, let's say, and then we're telling the potentiostat to switch between the two extreme potentials. So in this case, in this example, it was minus 0.5 volts and 0.8 volt versus ferrocene. And so here we're holding it at minus 0.5, then it switches to 0.8, holding it for 10 seconds, switching to minus 0.5, holding it for 10 seconds, and so on. And then what we do is we just decrease the pulse length, essentially, uh, in this example, to a quarter of a second. And what we're monitoring here is at what time point uh, do we lose contrast? Or at what time point are we switching? Is the potentiostat going faster than our um, material can you know, respond? And what we can see here, this is half a second, this, this switch here, is that when we're changing the potential at a half a second intervals, we're not able to fully reduce the polymer back into the colored state. So we're losing a bit of absorbance here. And so uh, this is where we would then see, you know, um, is sort of we're at the limits of what this material can do. Um, here, uh, you can essentially take one of these, um, this graph and just zoom it in. And then a lot of times what will people will do is they will report the time point at which you know, you've know you switched either to 100% of, of the full switch or 90 or 95%. You'll commonly see 90 or 95 because the human eye, that's any, anything higher than this that you, the, your eyeball can't tell the difference. Uh, but what we can see here, we're talking about, you know, I would say around, if I remember right, this is around 0 0.4 seconds to um, achieve this switch. Um, okay, so then I actually ended up getting, we got a pretty interesting question from a collaborator just before the pandemic. And they asked, you know, that, okay, since you guys work with these polymers and you can make a lot of colors and we know that you change the conductivity when you change the oxidation state, does that then mean that we can make a, a label where we don't need an underlying electrode at all? So basically, can we, uh, can the electrochrome also be the electrode? Um, and the reason they were interested in doing this was because ITO uh, accounts for around 80, 60 to 80 percent of the cost of a printed label. So if we could get rid of the ITO, we would make these labels much cheaper and in that way also more conducive to having us, as, as you know, a little sticker on an Amazon box, for example. Um, and again, so what this ended up doing, this put us in this sort of fun space where we we're actually looking at both switchable conductivity and optimizing that as well as optimizing the optical switch at the same time. Um, and that um, and that again, you know, brought about this whole thing. We, we need to start thinking about this bowl of spaghetti where, you know, we needed to, to find ways to, this is really what was going to determine how successful we were going to be uh, because we were now having to have, we, we needed to see this color change over the course of, you know, multiple centimeters. Um, and so we really needed this intermolecular charge transport to be good so that we would be able to get, um, you know, as good a switch as we could. And so the experiment, again, what we did here is, again, the same, you know, in, in a cuvette, we did exactly the same experiments as measuring, uh, you know, normal U of is. But instead of ITO, we just took a piece of glass, evaporated some gold on top so that we would have a nice, uh, robust contact point to, uh, for the potentiostat. And then what we did was we monitored in the spectrophotometer, but also via video, how quickly the polymer, or at all, if it at all, would switch and switch color even when it was just coated on glass without any kind of an electrode. And what we noticed was we actually found several different polymers and different colors that were able to do this. And, and, and that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing basically still frames of this video as this, we're applying an oxidizing potential and as this moving front is sort of moving down along the, the piece of glass. Um, and so we did find many uh, examples that could do this. 
but we did what you can see is that there's of course you know a little bit different in how quickly they were they were switching and that led us to do a lot of potential dependent conductivity measurements uh, which were extremely useful for this project and I would say for for any application where you know you're interested in in understanding the conductivity and uh, we have in our lab, we have a very nice bipotentia stat that we use for these measurements, but there's other ways to do it too. You can also use two separate potentia stats. Um, um, and then what you'll need is you'll need some kind of interdigitated electrodes. And there's numerous companies that sell, sell these. And essentially what you do is you have then, you basically have two working electrodes in addition to your counter and your reference electrode. And so what we do then is we hold the working electrode one, at a given potential, whatever we want. And then working electrode two, we sweep around that potential plus minus 10 millivolts, sort of in a similar way as when you do impedance measurements actually, um, at a very slow scan rate. And then we measure the current that we produce. And so the data that we generate looks like this on the bottom where we have these uh, lines. Um, and if this is done right, um, and you use the right, um, and you know, you control your potential and your scan rate, you're gonna be able to use Ohm's law to, and you know you just get the slope of the curve that you generate and then you have the conductivity. And then you can just replot your data as conductivity as a function of potential and you'll get something that um, looks like this. Um, and so what we were able to see then indeed, there was a couple of uh, cool things we noticed. First, uh, the conductivity actually doesn't need to be super duper high to be able to switch on without an underlying electrode. We actually saw this behavior work decently even at just 10 to the minus three Siemens per centimeter. What we did notice though, of course, that the, the conductivity does determine how quickly you can do this switch. Um, so if there's a, you know, you, you do wanna maximize conductivity for any application where this needs to be very rapid. Uh, but what we did notice, which was interesting, and to me, in my opinion, almost equally important, was that it wasn't just about how high the conductivity was, but it was, you know, how over how broad of a potential window can we maintain that conductivity, and that's what's going to determine the how long, or over what distance you can maintain, you know, a certain propagation speed of your, your switch. And so the, the broader this is, the better, because the less issues we're going to have with internal resistance that eventually will start uh, compromising the speed. Um, we've also used this since then as a, to look at more fundamental properties. We're now looking more at, you know, how can we make small changes to the structure uh, so that we see, you know, large increases in conductivity without changing the color. So we're learning a lot here. Um, just putting some methyl groups uh, on this thing here just got the conductivity up by three orders of magnitude. So again, this is where we can do a lot of playing, playing around with, with structure to tune intermolecular interaction, change that bowl of spaghetti, and in that way change the, the transport properties without necessarily changing color or, or something else. Um, I do want to point out, uh, for those of you who are interested in setting something up in your own lab, this is an awesome review. Um, that came out a couple of years ago that really gives a lot of tips and various ways that you can set this up in, in your own lab, depending on the capabilities that you have, and also discusses some of these caveats with these measurements uh, that can be very useful. So I absolutely recommend that uh, paper for those of you who want to learn more. Okay, so this is the last uh, part now that I want to talk about, and I was actually going to highlight here bioelectronics and actuation and talk about swelling and ion uptake, but I just realized just before this that, you know, this is actually something that's important for all of these applications, um, you know, to understand how materials swell and how much ions they uptake, um, and so I, start, I decided to highlight all of these. And so this last part is going to be about some of the very recent work we've been doing on EQCMD. Um, and EQCM was something that was used a lot in the early days of polymer uh, research, but then there was a bit of a slump. Uh, but now again, this has become really popular and everyone wants to do EQCMD. And that makes me really happy because I think this is a very powerful tool uh, for understanding these um, soft um, materials. Um, I will not go into any theory. Um, Gamry gave a, a great webinar not long ago at all that talked in great detail about the theory behind this technique. And I strongly encourage you to, to, to listen to it if you haven't already. 
to learn about you know all the ins and outs. But essentially what this is, uh, technique allows us to do is to relate changes in frequency of this oscillating uh, quartz crystal to a change in mass, either of the crystal itself or on a sample that we put on top of the crystal. Um, and so if you're lucky and your material is very well behaved, the, the sample that you have on top of the crystal, and it's sort of a thin film, this rigid, um, you're going to be able to use the Sauerbrei equation to very easily estimate with very high accuracy the mass. And so you can estimate uh, how many ions your film absorbs during oxidations or how many ions, you know, are ejected during reduction. Um, and again, all you're doing, you know, the, you know, the, the, depending on the crystal you use, this is going to be a constant that's known. The overtone is something that you, again, plug into the instrument and you, you know. And so really all you're doing is measuring the, the frequency change and then uh, calculating mass. Um, so why do we then care about the D? Why is it, why are we just, uh, you know, you can also just do EQCM. Well, in my opinion, when you're looking at soft materials and materials that swell a lot, uh, understanding how a material, the dissipation in that material changes is extremely useful. Uh, and if you also are able to have an, a way of measuring the change in dissipation, in addition to a change in frequency, you can get a bunch of information of thickness changes, you can get information about your viscosity, you can look at cross-linking, uh, you can talk about swelling and all these sorts of things. So it'll give you a much more complete picture of what's really going on um, during the redox process. I do have a caveat for people working with conjugated polymers, um, especially materials that swell a lot. You will, uh, there will be a risk where you end up in a domain where your material swells enough and becomes so soft that the changes in viscoelastic properties dominate over mass change. And then that, at that point, your Sauerbrei equation is absolutely not going to be usable. Um, so then you might need to resort to other, other ways of extract, uh, quantifying your mass change. Uh, in our case, when we work with soluble polymers and we have to make these thin coatings on the crystal before we put it into the instrument, um, the frequency and dissipation changes that we measure are relative to uh, a crystal with a film already coated on it, not relative to a bare crystal. Um, and so that puts some limitations on, on how well and accurately we can quantify ma uh, mass uptake because all the modeling tools that are currently available make the assumption that you're comparing something to a bare crystal. So it can be challenging and I encourage everyone to look at supporting information if uh, when, when looking at these uh, studies where they use conjugated polymers on these quartz crystals, because uh, you, you want to make sure that you know what, what approximations the authors are making there. Um, anyway, I'm going to show just at the end here a couple of examples of what our data looks like. Um, here's a cyclic voltammogram of one of our electroactive polymers. We're cycling here at 20 millivolts per second, and then we're measuring the change in frequency. This is during five cycles here that you can see. So we're um, here we're starting off, we put a freshly coated quartz crystal in the uh, EQCMD, and then we start applying a potential, we oxidize, and we see a frequency decrease. And that of course means the frequency is decreasing, our mass is increasing. And so it's a clear sign that we're then, you know, taking up ions and solvent, uh, no surprise. That's expected when we, you know, form these positive charge carriers. Uh, but what was really neat was when, when we go back to negative 0.5 volt and we're backed in this reduced form, we notice that we actually don't get back to this original state. And this is something that we would not have known without this technique. And what we were, and this strongly then suggests that we're actually trapping ions and electrolyte inside of our film uh, during this uh, CV cycling. Uh, what was really useful was when we started looking at the dissipation data, which was gathered simultaneously. And we could, again, in this case, we, you know, again, start off at zero, our film is freshly coated. We start oxidizing, we start uptaking solvated ions and forming charge carriers and our dissipation increases, indicating that our film is getting thicker and or softer. Uh, and again, that's expected. We, we should see some plasticization with, with all this solvent uptake. And then when we go back and reduce our film now to negative 0.5, we actually end up at 
a delta D that's lower than we were. And what this suggests then is that our film is actually, after it's been electrochemically cycled, it's actually stiffer, quote unquote, than it was when we deposited it. So we've actually electrochemically been able to change the conformation and the intermolecular interactions of our material. And sure enough, when we can look at the optical data, granted this was on ITO, but when we look at the optical data, we also see a fairly large optical change when we can compare the spectra. And the spectra sort of supports the dissipation data in that we see a redshift, we see these sharper peaks, and all of these indicate the same, that we're increasing planarity and we're increasing um, order. And which would explain the stiffening and perhaps also why we're starting to trap electrolyte. Um, there's other things we've done as well. This has been very cool at comparing uh, polymers. This is an ongoing project where we're looking at how making small changes to these substituents can change the redox process. And for example, this is very uh, neat here. Uh, if we look, especially here in the early stages. So what we're doing here, um, this is a little different. We're not doing a cyclic voltammogram. What we're doing here is we're applying a potential and holding it for five minutes and letting the, um, and measuring the frequency change, then increasing the potential and measuring the frequencies change. So this is like a really, really slow uh, CV almost. And what we saw, interestingly enough, that there's a huge difference, not only in the degree of frequency change that occurs with a very small change, but also at the rate that this mass change occurs. So in this polymer A here, we saw a very slow change in, in frequency over the course of five minutes, whereas here we saw almost an instantaneous stabilization. So we now have a good handle on how can we make small structural changes and really um, manipulate the, the rate and the extent of the swelling. Another cool thing we noticed, uh, you know, this is a way what I'm, what I'm trying to show here, you know, when we're switching between two extreme states. So this is like similar to the example when we were measuring the electrochromic switching time where we're just applying 0 0.8 volts and then minus 0.5 and then back to 0.8. Um, and what we can see here uh, over the course of five minutes that we you know we're not really when we're doing these switching between these extremes. Um, again, we're seeing very different levels of reversibility, at least in terms of the frequency chains, again, by making small structural changes, which was, again, very helpful for us when we're looking at designing new materials. And finally, what was this is the last piece of data I'm going to show because this is really cool. Uh, this is something we're still trying to figure out. And that was where we were looking at mass change via EQCMD and doing the exact same experiment, but monitoring the optical properties instead. And what we were able to see here was, again, this was the same example where the mass, the frequency, i.e. mass, changes very slowly over the course of five minutes. But if we look at that same process optically, there's an instantaneous change. And so what that means is the, the, the change in oxidation state is really, really quick. The charge carrier formation occurs in the matter of a fraction of a second, and the counter ions uh, are all going to be present. But that means that there is some, there's some other type of conformational chain, change that's occurring in our samples over a long period of time that have nothing to do with us changing the oxidation state of the polymer. And so this seemed to be some kind of indirect thing where there is some kind of morphological change happening in our sample that occurs at a completely different uh, time scale uh, than the electrochemical oxidation or reduction. And this is something that we're looking into more now and trying to figure out how we can take advantage of these um, these changes and how we can optimize our, our structures. Okay, so with that, then I'm gonna uh, sign off here. I've been uh, babbling here for about 55 minutes. Um, so hopefully what I've been able to convey is that this is trying to understand the redox processes in, the, in these types of materials is really complicated, but we there are so many fantastic tools available now, especially thinking about various ways of doing in situ measurements. I've just shown a small fraction um, that, of, of the type of tools that we use. And I think with all of these combined, I think there's really a lot we can learn and really begin to get a very clear picture on what's going on and how can we then as synthetic chemists 
really optimize and make small changes to a large molecule to really optimize performance. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, if there are any questions that pop up later, you can always reach me via email or LinkedIn. Um, um, and I'm happy to take any questions now as well if, if there is a few minutes. Great, uh, thank you, Anna. Um, I don't know if, uh, if, there's, if there are any questions, people can raise their hands uh, or they could give them uh, in chat and we can get Anna to answer them. Um, I actually have a, a, a question just on that last slide that you just showed. Um, can you go back one? Sure, sorry, it's weird. I can't use this. My arrows aren't working. Okay, okay. But this is, um, speaking from personal experience, this actually isn't that far off of some of what I did in grad school. Um, and you're on the left there, your slow mass change, even though you have an instantaneous, uh, essentially change in the absorbance, uh, it reminds me of changes I used to see uh, with solvent being slow to uh, basically get into the film or leave the film. You know, the, the charge transfer is nearly instantaneous, but the solvent moves much more slowly. Um, I don't know. Have you changed the solvent and, and seen if the rate of change of mass there uh, looks different? That is something that we're doing right now. And I honestly think you're, you're, that's exactly what is happening. I mean, what, what, what I assume has to be happening is that this has to be solvent or, I mean, I guess it could be salt, but it's, it's like, you know, cations and ions together, not, not there as for charge balance. So that's one thing we're going to probably look at is looking at different solvents. What we have done is, is what we have noticed is that again, changing the structure of the polymer, we do definitely see changes in, in the rate of this, uh, you know, or in, in some cases, we do see a much more instantaneous change in mass and, and, and stuff like that. So that's something we're going to be uh, working on, both looking at different solvents and, and potentially also looking at different ions. Very cool. Are there, are there other questions? I see, yes. Uh, let me unmute you. Oh, hey, uh, great presentation. Um, I was just wondering with those figures of merit that you had, like the uh, transmittance, total transmittance difference and the time for charging, wouldn't both of these, those things be very dependent on both thickness of the film and the area? So area uh, and hence capacitance for the charging time and thickness for the total transmittance change? Yes. Uh, but there are some caveats. Uh, so in, in, I would say in general, when talking about electroactive polymers that are conducting, we do not see a large effect of thickness, at least at a range, you know, that, that I think would be usable for this application. So we're talking, I mean, there's no point in, in making a very small optical change. So I would say over the course of, you know, 100 nanometers to 500 nanometers, you're not really seeing a large difference. Uh, as in th when you change the thickness, uh, I would assume though that for anything that's let you know as you decrease conductivity, you may start um, seeing larger discrepancies there. The area absolutely matters for sure. So at, as, at some point, again, because these are conducting, if you go on the orders of you know let's say, what am I going to say here? You know, ten by ten centimeters, I would say you're still seeing a very rapid switch. As you start getting larger than that, you know, you're going to eventually start seeing IR, you know, there's going to be an IR drop just from, you know, your underlying electrode. And then certainly you're going to see differences where the edge might switch a lot faster than the middle. So absolutely, the way we you know, report these figures of merit is that we always ensure that if we're making direct comparisons, we're comparing samples that have the same amount of chromophore um, and areas that are comparable so that we are actually making a meaningful comparison and and it, it, it is that that means that it can be difficult uh to make you know very quantitative quantitative comparisons sometimes if you're looking at different papers because people do uh just use different setups and things like that yep yep for sure thanks yeah oh and um in the in the talk i, I think you talked a lot about the spin coded and blade coded or other type of deposition or printed methods mm -hmm. uh, in general, 
do you have any comparisons between polymer that's been electro deposited versus the these type of uh polymers like uh, i guess one thing is it's maybe less tunable than something spin coated um because you can't tailor stuff as well but do you have any general comments about that yeah so honestly in grad school i work mainly on um electro deposition i think that's an awesome way honestly for eqcm that's fantastic i think it, it really helps uh, makes the data analysis easier um, in general, though, electropolymerized systems, you, you, it's, it's a lot more difficult to tune properties because if you want to tune color or something like that, because you really you only have a monomer then to work with. And, and you know, you're a little limited in what you can do with that monomer to really have a large change in the properties. Uh, what I have seen is electrodeposited materials do, you know, they don't have these long hydrocarbon chains on them. So certainly in some instances, you can get really uh, nice performance in terms of conductivity and switchability. Um, I do see these soluble materials having the advantage though, well, in part that we, we can, you know, change the structure easily is that, you know, printing something is easier to do on a large and quick scale. Um, in many cases, so it has that advantage. But I would say there there are some very highly performing electrodeposited polymers, and and there are there are certainly applications where that is a, a very good way of depositing a material. Yep, Nate, thank you. And and if I can sort of build on on you were just talking about the deposition. Somebody asked if you could uh, briefly go over how you got the polymer onto ITO. Oh, uh, for those examples that I show, well, there's, again, there's uh, many ways we can do this. Of all the photographs I showed today, those are all via spray coating or airbrush spraying. So we just get a spray gun from an art store. Uh, we hook it up to some nitrogen and a regulator, and then we fill a little container with this polymer ink, and then we just go to town. Okay. Um, all right, I have a, a question here. Um, when you were doing your IDE experiments, mm -hmm. uh, did you use open circuit uh, to stabilize the electrodes before you started the measurements? Yes. So it, you, we always hold it at open circuit first, and then this is a very slow experiment. So, you know, if you're, when you're scanning, we're doing, you know, plus my, so basically let's say we're holding the, the potential working electrode one at uh, one volt and we're scanning the other electrode plus minus five or plus minus 10 millivolts at, at 0.5 millivolts per second, multiple times. So we are measuring, I would say this is a, you know, more of a steady state measurement um, and not that dynamic, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay. um, other questions? I have one, Chris. Um, uh, and it was a great talk, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, awesome. Um, you know, you're talking about these long-term um, stiffening of the films uh, with cycling. Mm -hmm. and I was curious if you'd ever looked at, you know, very high cycle numbers, you know, like cycling a film for a thousand times, you know, because I'm sure a lot of the energy guys might be interested in the, the stiffness of the film mm -hmm. you know, over these long times. We do, uh, or I should say, well, well, uh, yes, we've looked at it sort of indirectly. So what we've done, what's easier for us to do over long periods of time is to look at the changes in optical properties. So once we, once we see that, okay, we see a stiffening of the polymer and that the way that translates into an optical change um, is, you know, uh, let me see if it's, of course, this is slower than I'd hoped. Um, Come on. Yeah, here. So we know that, okay, the stiffening of the, the gray, this gray curve becomes this green curve. And so we know that, okay, that's what that means. And so then it's, it's very quick for us to do um, these long-term experiments where we're, you know, cycling thousands or tens of thousands of times and monitoring the optical properties instead, since that change is so rapid. And what we indeed do see now in some of these polymers that this there's a larger change happening in the beginning, but I would say that there definitely it does in, in uh, this example specifically actually does continue to stiffen even up to a thousand cycles and thousands of cycles. And certainly, you know, it doesn't compromise the redox activity, but it certainly, you know, does change 
other properties. And it, we've also noticed that as, it, as these materials stiffen, uh, we also see a slight decrease in how, uh, in, no, sorry, a slight increase in the switching time. So the color change ends up being slower as the material gets stiffer and more ordered. So I think thanks to now that we can combine EQCMD with the optical data, I think we're going to get a lot more information of what's really going on. But absolutely, for any application, we don't work with any polymer nowadays that don't doesn't pass 10,000 switches. So stability is critical. That's very cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was going to say I've got a question. If no, if uh, we're we're actually there are several. It was a great talk. I enjoyed that. Um, no, thank you. And but uh, the 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 one question that I really wanted to ask had to do with the bipotentiostatic setup for your interdigitated array. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious about the current path because if you've got both of those electrodes. One of them is being held by one potential by, by one side of the bipod, and the other is being biased. I mean, the the hold and the bias are against a reference electrode. So, in in the current between those two is now going to a counter electrode instead of from one to the other. So, how does the yeah. relative bias of those two working electrodes function in a bipotentiostat setup as opposed to just you know a single potentiostat connected across the two? You know, that's an awesome question. And I'm probably not the right person to answer it about how those circuits are. Uh, I, I tried to get a better understanding of how it works based on, you know, this, this paper that I uh, referred to where they talk about how, you know, the differences, if you're using two potentia that what are the, you know, additional steps you have to take because you do have to add some resistors to your circuit okay. in order to not have crosstalk. Uh, but I have to say, there's. I, I'm assuming that there's just you know something in that box <laughs> that me that controls it in a way where the two circuits aren't communicating. But okay. I, I really don't have a good um, you know electrical engineering explanation on exactly what's going on. I'm not talking about on the potentiostat side. I'm talking about oh. actually in the cell. Where is your current path? And are you the between those because the one electro since both of those are being controlled versus a, a reference electrode, I'm assuming, and there's a counter electrode in there that completes the current path for both yeah. of them. So the current isn't flowing from one working electrode to the other on it's flowing from both of those working electrodes through a counter yeah. electrode. Mm -hmm. So how does so, so you but you talked about biasing the one plus or minus 10 versus yeah. the other and that's so I, I, I was say, a little confused there. Yeah, so I would assume that the current on on the working electrode that you're holding, I mean in, in the you know it'll it'll take some current to to set that potential. Mm -hmm. But once you're holding it there, I would assume that that current passing is is very small. And then the really the current change that you're monitoring is this other electrode that you're sweeping. But honestly, you know, I'd have to I'd have to get back to you with a better answer. Okay. To, uh, you know, to explain this in a better way. But um, yeah. So, yeah. So, but very good question. And something I certainly thought about as well when we were trying to figure out if we wanted to use a bipotentiostat or two potentiostat. And there is definitely a difference in, in the current path, depending on which one you use and your setup. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so I think um, I think we'll stop here then. And I want to uh, thank you, Anna, again for this great talk. Um, and to everybody who's here, it is it was recorded, and we will have the recording available. We're going to be sending out uh, an email tomorrow with a link to that recording, so you can view it. And as Anna also stated, if you have questions, uh, you can email her uh, directly after this talk. So absolutely, again, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Anna, for that talk, and we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, thank you. It was nice being here. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye, right, everybody. Bye.